We'll do our very best religious song we can.
Yes. Bless you, Jesus. We sang this chorus a couple of times. I think it's one we need to learn. Holy Spirit, come and fill this place. Bring us healing and your warm embrace. Sure power, make your presence known. Holy Spirit, come fill this place. Breath of God, we need a touch from you. Shine down on us with the light of truth. Stir our hearts and set our spirit free. Holy Spirit, come fill this place. Holy Spirit, come fill this place. You sing it now, come on. Holy Spirit, come and fill this place. Bring us healing. Bring us healing and your woman. Show your power. Show your power. Make your presence known. Holy Spirit, come fill this place. Breath of God, we need a touch. Breath of God, we need a touch from you. Shine, shine down on us with the light of truth. Stir our hearts, stir our hearts and set our spirits free. Holy Spirit, come fill this place. Holy Spirit, come fill place. One more time. Let's sing it. Holy Spirit. Sing it to him. Holy Spirit. Bring us healing and your warm embrace. Show your power. Show your power. Make your presence known. Holy Spirit. from you shine down on us with the light of truth stir our hearts and set our spirit free holy spirit come fill this place holy spirit come fill this place Fill this place. Ah. Come fill this place. Come fill this place. We're hungry, Lord. Fill this place. Fill this place.
Some of you just need to lay it down in the presence of the King. He's here. He's here. This morning when I opened the book, I don't a lot of times hear the Lord say strong words to me about what to sing. I just flow with whatever God's doing. And sometimes it's nothing I plan. But when I opened the book this morning, I just felt like the Spirit of the Lord is here to touch some people who are very heavy. And uh, a lot of people say, how do you be heavy in the midst of revival? The devil isn't dead. The oppressor is still trying to oppress. He's still trying to depress. Even while God is moving. And there are many of you here today who are just asking the Lord, Father, I need a fresh touch from you. And that word sounds so trite, but I'm telling you, he's here. He's here to give you a fresh touch. With this little song, kind of, I feel like somebody needs to hear it. If the world from you withholds all its silver and its gold, and you have to get along on meager fare, just remember in his word how he feeds the little birds. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. And if this morning your body suffers pain and your health you can't regain, Jesus, if your body suffers pain and your health you can't regain, your soul is almost sinking in despair. Jesus knows the way you feel. He still saves and he can heal. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. And when your enemies assail and your heart begins to fail, don't forget your God in heaven still answers prayer. He will make a way for you. I know he'll bring you through. Just take your burden to the Lord. When your youthful days are gone and old age is stealing on and your body bends beneath the weight of care, Jesus will never leave you then. He'll go with you all the way to the end. If you take your burden to the Lord, hallelujah, and leave it there. Sing it out. Leave it there. Leave it there.
our sins and griefs to bear. Hallelujah. And what a privilege to care. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace sing. Oh, what peace we often. sing one more. If you have trials and temptations, are you finding there's trouble anywhere? Oh, hear us. You should never be discouraged. All you have to do is take it to the Lord, the Lord in prayer. Can we find, come on. How many of you would be honest today and say that you have something in your life that you need help with? Could I see your hand, please? Wow. I want you to sing that last verse one more time. I like that part. I like the verse, but I also like, I think it's the chorus where it says, Oh, what needless pain we bear. This morning, knowing the message I was going to preach today, I'm going to preach part three on the suddenlies of God. And knowing what I was going to be dealing with and knowing how God has helped me uh, even in the last few weeks. I looked back this morning and was doing some introspection and I looked back and I just saw how that God picked me up and carried me and helped me. And this morning, even before you sang that song, I was humming that in my bedroom this morning and I was humming that part, oh, what needless pain we bear. And friend, I want to tell you something this morning. We've got a friend. Yes, we do. <laughs> We've got a friend, and his name is Jesus. Do you love him? Yeah. He's going to sing that one more time, and as he does, I want you just to close your eyes. And Lyndall, I want you to sing it to them. If you want to hum along, that's fine. But I want you just to close your eyes, and I, I want this to just sort of prep us for the message today, because I'm going to be going to the book of Chronicles, and I'm going to be dealing with God's suddenlies, part three. And I just want to, boy, I got something to tell you in a few minutes. It's, it's wonderful. Close your eyes and sing it to us, Lyndall. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. And it's all because we do not carry. We don't take everything everything to God in prayer. Pastor, I want to do this verse. It's all yeah, right. Go ahead. Yeah. I like this part. Are you weak and heavy laden? Are you cumbered with a load of care? You need to remember this this morning. Precious Savior, He's still our refuge. And you can take all that problem to the Lord in prayer. Tell me, do your friends 
despise, forsake me. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And in his arms, he'll hold you and shield you. Yes, he will. You will find Thank you, Lord. a solace there. Everybody sing the chorus together. Thank you. If you will, take your Bibles this morning, and we want to get right into the Word of God. It's early, so that means I can preach late. <laughs> 11 o'clock. Mine, I think, says 15 till 11. <laughs> Today, I want to come to you, and I want to minister to you. I want you to let the Lord stroke you today and love on you and bring you courage and hope. Amen? Second Chronicles <clears throat> chapter number 20. <clears throat> you know where Second Chronicles is? It's right after First Chronicles. The suddenlies of God. For lack of a better place to go today, I'm going to choose this scripture because this pretty well embodies what I want to say to you today in regard to this subject, the suddenlies of God. And the subtitle is, Be Loosed to Expect the Unexpected. Would you say that with me? Be Loosed to Expect the unexpected. Say it with me again. Be loose to expect the unexpected. And I want you to do that today because I'm going to tell you in just a few minutes um, some things that I really feel like you're going to. Why don't you keep your Bibles in your laps? If you have a pencil or a pen, you don't mind marking in your Bible, I'm going to give you 10 points at the end of my message. <laughs> Steve would get a kick out of that if he was here today. 10 points at the end of my message. How many does the first part have? None of your business. <laughs> Second Chronicles chapter 20. And we'll begin reading with verse 14. And I'll go quickly. Then, uh, I'm sorry, let's go back to verse 13. And Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones and their wives and their children. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Madani, the Levite, and the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said... Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed, by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but it is the Lord's. Tomorrow, go ye down. Say that with me. Tomorrow. Say it again. Tomorrow. Say it one more time. Go down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz. And you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jerel. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand you still, see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow, say it again. Tomorrow, go out against them. For the Lord will be with you. Ah, uh, hallelujah. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites and the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. And they rose early in the morning, went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, 
and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophet, and so shall you prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, that they should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army. And he told them to sing this, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were what? Yeah. Now, how many of you knows, when you look in verse 22, the second line there, it said, the Lord set ambushments. How many of you knows when he set ambushments, they are going to be smitten? Amen? Amen. This ain't no Serbia deal. This ain't no Iraq deal. This is a God deal here. Verse 23. For the children of Ammon, Saddam Hussein will still be on the throne when he gets through. Verse 23, hallelujah, just thought I'd put that in there because <laughs> he's still tormenting us today. God don't let our tormentors remain. Can you say amen? amen? God brings it to a close. I said God brings it to a close. God will put an end to the devil, I'm telling you. I said God will put an end to the devil. And God will not let your problem go on and 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 on. He'll say, you cut it off. Amen. Where was I? What verse? 23. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Mount Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. Then that's something. They just turned around and said, come here, I'm going to kill you. You know, come here, let me kill you. They said, okay, here. Isn't that, stu isn't that stupid? But brother, whenever God gets in there and brings confusion, the devil hadn't got a dog's chance. Amen. Where am I at? 24, okay. All that for one verse. And when Judah came forward toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, there were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil, say, take away the spoil. They found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels which they stripped off of themselves. Can you imagine going into battle like that as an enemy? And they, they got the jewelry on. You know why they wore the jewelry? God told them to take the jewelry with them. Because their body was a truck, a transport to haul all the stuff in there. Amen? God said you won't need your bodies anymore nor your jewels either. I'm going to let you be killed, and I'm going to let you drop your jewels there so they can come in and pick them up. They didn't even know it. Can you imagine going in with a Rolex watch on to fight? Can you imagine going in with a heart-shaped diamond on your finger, and, and you got blood splattering everywhere, and there's your heart-shaped diamond? They had jewels. Think about that. Isn't that stupid? Why did they take it with them? I guess they wanted to have a fashionable battle. But anyway... Where am I at? Yeah. Both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels which they stripped off of themselves more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering the spoil. It was so much. Well, on the fourth day as they assembled themselves in the valley of Baraka, there they blessed the Lord. And therefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Baraka unto this day. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. Say that with me. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. Can you say that with, with meaning? We have come through some places in our lives, and the longer we live, the more places we're going to come through. Now, friend, this morning, I want to go, get right into the Word of God because I've got a lot to share and a lot to say, and uh, this really gives me the opportunity today to say what I want to say, this story does, because it embodies 10 points at the end of my message. And look this way, please. These, excuse me, these 10 points are very short, 
and each one of the points is no more than three words. I think there's only one point that has four words. Maybe there's two, but one point I think has four words and one maybe has five words. But every one of these points is to the point. They're short. They are revealing. <clears throat> and I'm dealing with God's suddenlies. I think myself, what I have seen, and I travel every week, I'm out somewhere in America preaching the gospel to a lot of preachers on, on Tuesday mornings. There's preachers there of all faiths, all denominations every Tuesday. I see a lot of callers. I see a lot of Episcopal priests, a lot of Catholic priests. I see a lot of Baptists, Southern Baptist pastors there. There's a lot of Methodist pastors there. Every Tuesday morning I meet with pastors wherever I am of the local regional area, and the churches get the pastors together for me to come in and talk to them, and it's a great honor and a great privilege for me to be able to do that every week, and I love it. I love it when I stand behind that pulpit to speak to those preachers. I feel more at home there than I do anywhere in the world whenever I'm up there talking to those preachers. It's just an opportunity and a door, a window of opportunity that God has given me, and I love it. But what I'm hearing from so many people, and, and, and preachers included, is that there are so many of God's people today that have been intertwined and enthralled with a lot of different kinds of battles in their lives. Battles with children, battles with finances, battles with employers, battles with corporations, battles with lawyers, battles in their churches, uh, battles with the devil, all kinds of things. And they just feel so wrapped up like they have vines just choking the life out of them. They feel so intertwined and wrapped up with problems and troubles that many have abdicated and they have given in and given up and they know that the Lord is real and they know that they're going to heaven, but they've sort of given up and they are not really expectant anymore. And if they are expectant that God is going to help them, they see it way off in the distant future. They have lost the expectancy that God can do a suddenly in their life. They've lost that, that expectancy. But I want to minister this morning, and those of you that are watching me by television, those of you that are ministers, those of you in this Pensacola area, and those of you that watch us by national television, I want you to listen to me. I want you to be loosed to expect the unexpected. And God wants to do a very quick and powerful work. Now, I'm not going to tell you that all of your troubles are going to be over in two hours or two days or two weeks. I'm not going to say that because I have just come through a, a season in my life that has been long, protracted, vicious, rough, and it took a lot out on me. But here's what happened. A month ago, I had been planning on preaching this sermon for about five or six months. I kept, as, I, as, I, as I'd be off different places preaching in other localities, I would mention God's suddenlies. Just about everywhere I would go, I'd mention God's suddenlies. But I, I'd get back here, and I just didn't feel anything about it. Until about a month ago, and the Lord released me to begin preaching on his suddenlies, and here's what the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, what I am doing in your life right now I'm letting you feel, and I'm letting you experience it, so when you preach this, you will have a fervor about what you're preaching to help my people be loose to expect the unexpected. And he said, what I have done for you, I'm going to also do for your congregation. Can you say amen? Are you listening? God said, what I have done for you I am going to do for your congregation. I don't know how far I'm going to get this morning because I feel a left turn coming already. Is that all right? Well, I better get back to it. I better get back to it. Let's, let's go. Now, look at Romans. Just keep your finger there in 1 Chronicles, Second Chronicles. Go to Romans real quick. Yee. Thank you, Lord. Devil, back off. I said, back off, devil. Just back completely off. You're whipped. 
your whip right now. I said your whip right now, devil. Back off. Shoot. In the name of Jesus. Romans chapter 9 and verse 28. I love this verse of Scripture. I don't know if you ever paid much attention to it or not before the series, but I want you to remember this. Now, Isaiah 9 and 28. Huh? Yeah, that's what I said. Romans 9, 28. <laughs> Romans 9, 28. For he will finish the work. I like that. He will finish the work. Say that with me. He will finish the work. Say it again. He will finish the work, and he will cut it short in the right way. Say that. And he will cut it short in the right way. Because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Say that. The Lord will make a short work upon the earth. Now, here we go back into the book of Second Chronicles, and we see here a setting. I only want to use the setting. I don't want to take a lot of time with a lot of the details in this particular passage of Scripture, but I want to take the setting. Now, <clears throat> if you're like I am, we're all, of course, we're, of course, we're all human beings, and if you're like I am, you love the blessings of the Lord. How many of you love the blessings of the Lord? I thank God for what he has blessed me with. I thank God for my family. I thank God for my wife of my youth. I thank God for my children, my boys. I thank him for my grandchildren. I thank him for the church that he's let me pastor. I thank him that he sent a major move of God to this church where I pastor. I thank him for my home. I thank him for my possessions. I thank him for the food that we eat. I thank him for the rain outside. I thank him for peace when I lay my head on my pillow at nighttime. I thank him for my health. You know, I, I, there's so much to thank God for. The blessings of God are absolutely innumerable. The blessings of God are so many in your life and in my life that you can't count them. But there is always lurking in the shadows something out there. We'll just use the name, the generic name, Satan or the devil. There's always the devil out there lurking in the shadows, and he's spying you out, and he wants to come, and he wants to rob you of your peace, wants to rob you of your health, wants to rob you of your family, wants to rob you of your joy, amen? Wants to rob you of your possessions, wants to rob you of your money, wants to rob you of your marriage, wants to rob you of your business. There's a lot of things that the devil wants to rob you of, and he's always out there. He has you under surveillance, and he wants to come in and do his dastardly deeds. Now, in this setting, here was the children of Israel, Judah. And the Bible says that they looked up one day, and they had an invasion on their hands. There were three nations out there called Moab, Ammon, and Mount Seir. In other words, there were three nations gathered out in the valleys and on the sides of the mountains, and they were poised and ready for a strike against God's people. Now, sometime when we read the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, we read the Bible from the perspective that it's a fairy tale. We read the Bible from the perspective that, oh, yeah, mm, okay, mm -hmm, yeah. And we don't even sometime read the Bible like these were real people or like this was a real event. But I want you to look this way. This was a real event, and this was real people, and there was a real threat. Now, that's like saying today in modern terminology that Syria and Jordan and Arabia were gathered right outside Jerusalem, and they were about to come in and invade Jerusalem and Israel. It's like cutting on CNN and CNN saying, ladies and gentlemen, there's been a fast development over in the Middle East. Syria, the king of Syria and his armies, and the king of Jordan and his armies, and the king of Arabia have all gathered outside around Megiddo, and they're all around, and they're going to come in, and they're going to swoop in on Jerusalem. Now, I want to ask you a question. How would you feel if you were an inhabitant of Israel, and you looked up, and you had three major 
nations outside that was staring at you with blood in their eyes and war in their heart, how would you feel? I'll tell you what you would think. I want you to think for just a minute with me about the implications of such a threat. Now, I want you to listen to me. Here's the implications of this confrontation. They were going to break down the walls of the city. In other words, they were going to destroy real estate. They were going to greatly impact Israel's everyday life. The people were going to be greatly affected. That means that people was going to be wounded in battle. Blood was going to be shed. It meant that troops was going to come and break families up. It meant that kids was going to be put in chains and taken away to live in another nation separated from their mothers and daddies. It meant that fathers were going to be tortured, some of them were going to be chained, and some were going to be killed and made prisoners, and some were going to be forced to live the rest of their lives separated from their precious wife and precious children. It meant that women was going to be raped. So when they heard Israel was experienced enough in warfare that they knew what war meant back in those days especially. Here in the year, almost year 2000, we just saw on our television sets how that a nation was pillaged. Houses were burned. Women were raped. People had to leave and they had to live out in the woods and the sides of the mountains with the snakes and the beasts. We saw it in our generation, in this modern technological era, we saw it. That's what an enemy, a vicious, abled enemy means. Israel had a lot of enemies that was about to come against them. So what we're talking about here is we're talking about the fact that business was, was going to be destroyed. Assets are going to be taken away. They're going to be history. Women raped, men in chains, children taken away as slaves. It was going to be hell. So, when the word came, the word of the Lord came upon Jehaziel. I want to tell you something, friend, about the God that we serve. The God that we serve sees and knows everything that's going on in your life. Are you listening? It may be immaterial to me, but if it's important to you, it moves the heart of our God. Amen? It may be immaterial to somebody else that looks upon your situation, but if it concerns you, it concerns our God. He cares. And he looked upon Israel and he saw that all of this was about to take place. It was going to be vicious. It was going to be like a bunch of rabid animals were going to be turned loose. Once that wall was knocked down, they was going to come in and they was going to overwhelm and absolutely smash and destroy the people of God. So I'll give you in just a minute 10 points whenever God's about to do a suddenly and whenever you can expect a suddenly from God, I'm going to give you 10 points real quick. But first of all, when the Spirit of the Lord came that day on Jehaziel, God was actually trying to preempt their crisis. Are you listening? Friend, God wants to preempt your crisis. Are you listening? I'm going to say it again. God wants to preempt your crisis. He sees it gathering. He sees that it's a viable opponent. He sees that it's very real. He sees sometimes that you can be outnumbered. And God wants desperately to speak to you. Now, I'm going to tell you what I think. I just want you to think along these lines with me for a minute. And I want you to see if the devil hasn't done a masterful job in our generation. Now, let me ask you a question. If we are living in the last days, for God's sakes, the last days, we're not talking about living back then. We're talking about living in the last days. We're talking about there must be on the horizon, there must be on the horizon some very vicious opponents that would love to lurk on the church right now. There must be on the horizon somewhere in the near future a man by the name of Antichrist 
that's going to cause everybody in the world to take a mark, and if they don't, he's going to take their head off. He's out there somewhere, probably alive today. And the Bible says when the coming of the Lord takes place, all hell is going to break loose. The dikes and the dam of wickedness and evil is going to gush forth on this generation. Uh, the Bible says it's going to be a time of trouble like the world has never seen before. That's going to happen. That's imminent. But here we are in these closing hours, in the waning hours of this dispensation of grace, the church age, and we are under attack. God's people, you can say what you want to, God's people are under attack. You get over one thing and there's another thing coming. We are under attack. And I tell you, a masterful job that hell is doing. Hell is trying its best to discredit pastors where people won't listen to them anymore. And hell is trying its best to discredit evangelists. So people say, all he cares about is money. And he anoints journalists to write in the newspapers where it won't just be local, but it'll go around the globe to discredit a move of God and a man of God that really has a heart to help God's people. And the devil tries to discredit and tear that man down so people that really need a word from God won't believe in anybody. Are you listening? And in our churches, there's enough gossip goes on in average churches across America by board members and by church members that keeps the pastor so disassembled and so tore down in the eyes of the people that people mainly come now just for religious purposes. They don't expect him to be a man of God and they certainly don't expect him to have a word from God. And so hell is coming in like a bulldozer on the church and he's running over us. You know why? Because we don't believe the prophets anymore. And we're not being established. And we're not prospering. And that word prospering there doesn't mean just financial prospering, but that word there prospering means to come to full age like a plant that has come from a little tender fragile plant to a tree. That's what it means to prosper, to bear fruit. It's got acorns on that tree. That's what it means to be prospered. It means to be helped all the way to maturity. I see so many people remaining babies. I see so many churches remaining fragile. They're still on incubators. I see so many churches that are still in intensive care wards. They've been there for 35 years. Why? Because this right here. And because they've tore down the preacher, preacher after preacher. Some churches are 16 years old and they've had 23 preachers. Been in business 16 years, and they've had 23 preachers. I was in a church not long ago in a, in a distant northern state, and they came to me, and the pastor was so discouraged, and he said, Brother Kilpatrick, this church is 16 years old, and I'm the 23rd pastor in 16 years. And I thought about Brownsville has been, in business, has, has been a church since 1939, and I'm only the eighth pastor. You know what that says? It says something to me that the people of this church down through the years has reverenced the man of God and they've listened to the man of God. They would not let the press, they would not let other church members so tear their man of God down in their eyes, but they were willing to put those people out and trust the man of God and believe the report of the Lord. And I know that some preachers don't need to be trusted. I know that as good as anybody. But I tell you, whenever you see it in denomination after denomination and church after church, it's not just a preacher problem, it is a devil problem. It is a devil problem. And that day, whenever the Spirit of God came on Jehaziel, there was a man there. You know why the Bible says he was the son of ben and I, he was the son of Zechariah, he was the son of this and son of that? You know why the Bible says that? It seems like that would only be important to his mother and God, you know? You know what I'm saying? It seems like that his lineage and his, his genealogy would only be important to his mother and God. You know, why would we want to know that? You know why the Bible says he came from this one, this one, this one, this one? Because it was a house of prophets. It was a house of prophets. Jehaziel was a prophet from a string of prophets, a long line of prophets, and they had integrity. And they were trusted by Israel down through the years. So in other words, when great, great, great granddaddy was a man of God and a prophet and Israel was going through hell and great, 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 great granddaddy stood up and said, yay, thus saith the Lord. 
it was like E.F. Hutton. Everybody said, you know, because he was a man of God. And you know what? Israel heard that man of God, and they believed that man of God, and then they prepared to do what God told them through that man of God. And so the Bible says he was a son of so-and-so, so-and-so, and so 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 What he was saying is he's from a long string of prophets. So that day when they looked up and they saw all those armies up there on the side of the hill, and they knew what was about to happen, all hell was going to break loose. They were standing there as if to say, oh, my God. But there was enough integrity in the camp through that certain family that when Jehaziel stood up and he said, hey, I got a word from God. They said, because great, great granddaddy had a word too. And granddaddy had a word and your daddy had a word. Let's hear what you got to say, boy. Amen. Let's hear what you got to say. And Jehaziel lifted up his voice. Ooh, I like this. Will you look at it one more time? Chapter 20. It said, now Jehaziel. Then upon Jehaziel, verse 14, the son of Zechariah, son of Benaniah, son of Jael, Mananiah, sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. Aren't you thankful that God in a time like this, has got somebody he can speak through. But you know what the most important thing about it is after God found somebody to speak through? That God had a people that would believe what God said through that man. Listen, I don't ever remember where God thundered down to Israel and said, rrr, rrr, rrr. he always spoke through Moses. God speaks through people. But see, the devil has come in in our hour and he is so discredited and he's pulled the underpinnings of trust out from the American church that now when you cruise across your television set and you see preachers up preaching, you think automatically, by the way we've been programmed by this Americanized society, you think America, immediately American, you think about that, that they're in it for the money, he's not real. Wonder how many men, wonder how many women he slept with. I wonder, is he a homosexual? I wonder this, I wonder that. And you say, oh, that was a good sermon, but you never let your heart receive what he really said because you got such suspicion in your heart against the man of God. And the devil has done a masterful job in this hour of discrediting the servants of God. But I tell you what, I believe before the Lord comes, God's raising up a Joshua generation. I believe God's raising up a Joshua generation that will stand up and say, thus saith the Lord. And people in the churches are going to back off and say, yes. And I want to tell you something else, friend. You better hear me. If you're waiting for the perfect church and the perfect pastor, you're going to fry in hell one day. Because there'll never be a perfect church and there'll never be a perfect man of God. The one preaching to you has all kinds of imperfections. And I've told you that from day one. But I tell you what, my heart is still after God. I said, my heart is still after God, and I want to be a man of God. And if I blow it, I'll tell you I blew it. And I've had to do that too in 17 years. I've had to eat crow, and I did it. Why? Because I crowed when I shouldn't have. <laughs> that wasn't planned. Today, people are in the very same kind of crisis. You listening? Today, there's an enemy out there. It's a structured powers and principalities type thing. The devil's coming against you to enslave your kids. You listening? He's coming to put shackles on them and lead them away. And the shackles I'm talking about is alcohol. And the shackles I'm talking about is drugs. And the shackles I'm talking about is pornography. And the devil is coming in to break down the walls of your house to take your kids and shackle them and haul them off. Oh, they may still live at home, but they're gone, friend. They're a prisoner of hell. And he's come to split up homes and to take the daddies away and make a prisoner out of him. The devil is coming to divorce. He's coming to homes across America and around the world to tear those homes up by a spirit of divorce. Taking daddy captive. Taking mama captive. 
And the devil's come to mess up the mothers, to besiege businesses and cause them to fail and suck away your assets. And across America, people are oppressed like I have never seen. But I tell you today, I want to bring you a good word. And the Lord says this, be loosed to expect the unexpected. God said, it's not going to take a long time. Ben and I have said this twice. He said, tomorrow. I like that. He didn't say 2012. And the people would have said, oh, that's, that's good, but that's not going to do us any good. You know, I'm glad that when the word came, it was tomorrow. You know what some people would do if that kind of word came in some of your homes and some of your churches and some of you are sitting here this morning and God right now is trying to give you this word. You know what some of you are trying to do right now? You're saying, oh, he just got another sermon. Oh, he's just preaching another sermon. He just found him another sermon to preach. Nothing's going to happen to me. Hey, be like the man in the days of the leper that said if God make windows in heaven, they trampled him. I tell you what, friend, this is the day of divine visitation. This is the day of refreshing. This is the last days. This is the day God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I'm not going to be a doubting Thomas. I'm going to believe the word of God. And I tell you what else, I'm going to believe the word of his prophets. I'm going to get out of doubt. I'm going to get out of skepticism. I'm going to get out of that critical spirit, and I'm going to start believing God. How about you? Jehaziel lifted his voice, and he said, tomorrow, and the people listened. He said, tomorrow. What he's saying is, God's going to do a quick work, a quick work. He's going to bring a quick end. Believe, he said. The king said, believe the prophet, and you shall prosper. Believe, and you'll be established. Now, I'm going to give you 10 things real quick. Hallelujah. In order to believe God to do it suddenly, there's 10 things that I see here. I especially want to say to you this morning, everybody listening to me, I especially want to say to you, I want to say it one last time because I don't want to be back on this again. Some of you are set like concrete you have lost anticipation, you have lost expectation, and some of you are set in concrete that whatever God is doing in your life is a long way off. But I tell you, if you will believe me this morning, as I come before you as a man of God, if you'll believe me and have faith in the word that I'm delivering from you, that it's a word from God, things are gonna begin to pop in your life quickly. I said quickly. I don't care if they've been going on three years, five years, or five months. God is about to bring a sudden end to some things in your life. Woo! Hallelujah! Up in the balcony. I said up in the balcony. I speak this in the name of the Lord, in the choir, out in the congregation. Those of you watching by television, I speak it in the name of the Lord. God is about to bring a sudden end to that thing in your life. It's been going on a long time. But God, this is a day of visitation, friend. This is the day of outpouring. The Lord is about to come. Go. Hallelujah. Y'all could help me preach a little bit. Just sitting up there looking at me. Oh, really, God. Got that Sunday morning thing on you. Ten things. The first one is, we find it in chapter 20 and verse 3. Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. The first thing you do when you want to hear from God and God wants to give you a word about it suddenly is you've got to seek the Lord. Number one, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Make the Lord your point of resort. Are you listening? Make the Lord your point of resort. Friend, so many times when something happens, the first thing we do is we depend on friends. 
We depend on friends. And sometimes they can be on and sometimes they can be off. Sometimes they can be full of faith and say, glory to God. And sometimes they can say, oh, my God, when you call them. You know what I mean? Because they're human beings. But how many of you know we serve a God that changes not? Seek the Lord. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the president and the cabinet and the Pentagon would seek the Lord? Woo! Wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, most of us, whenever something happens, we begin to seek out the counsel of men. We begin to seek the opinions and the impetus of men and other women. Second thing, I'm going to go through these quickly. The Bible says in verse 3, look at it, chapter 20, verse 3, and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. In other words, they humbled their soul. Listen to me. They humbled their soul. What does it mean to humble the soul? It means that you confess, that you repent of every sin in your life, and you're doing it honestly. And you're doing it as a move of faith. And you're saying, God, we're flawed, we've got problems, and we've got weaknesses. But Lord, in preparing for what you're going to do here, we've got to have help. I'm humbling my soul. And you know what your soul is? I've told you so many times. Your soul is your mind. You've got to humble your mind. The Bible said you've got to cast down. Say that with me. Cast down imaginations. You've got to pull down strongholds and every high thing that lifts itself up against the Lord, not for the Lord. You've got to reach up there and those things that lift themselves up against God You've got to grab a hold of them and pull them down. Those things that lift themselves up in a time of crisis, friend, you'll be shocked how things can all of a sudden lift themselves up against God. You know what it's trying to do? It's trying to defeat you right off the bat before you even have time to move. They'll lift themselves up quickly. And the Bible says reach up there and pull down those high things and cast down imaginations. Humble that mind. Oh, that mind is so arrogant. Say it with me. My mind is arrogant. That mind of yours is so arrogant. It's so self-sufficient. It is so independent. It thinks it knows. But the Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. To prepare for suddenly, you've got to humble that mind. Get out of camping out mentally for the long haul. You're just camping out and waiting and waiting, and oh, God's going to talk to me eventually. Friend, when you got three armies out there, you better hear from God quickly. How many of you even have confidence anymore that you can hear from God? You know what I'm finding? I'm finding so many people have lost confidence they can even hear from God. They think only preachers hear from God. You hear from God more than you realize you do. Did you know sometimes God's talking to you? It's like, it's like right now in this room, there's AM and FM music in this room right now. If I had an apparatus called a radio, an AM, FM radio, I could pull it in, and you'd be surprised what you'd hear in this room right now. They're in here right now. Those, those signals are in this room right now. You can't feel them, and you can't see them, but they're in here, and if I had that little apparatus, I could just pull in an AM, FM station, and we could hear music or news or whatever we wanted to hear. Did you know in your life, all the time, there's the things of God around you all the time like this right here? Just like this all around you. That close to you, close as the nostrils, the breath in your nostrils. That close. But you know what? We won't tune that in. We'll tune in our friends. We'll read a book. We'll go to the medical dictionary. The doctor says a word we didn't understand. We won't bow our knee and talk to God. We'll run to the medical dictionary. And if it's unabridged or not updated, we'll go to the drugstore and buy another one. You know why? Because we've tuned in to something other than what the Lord is saying. Are you listening? It's amazing the things that God is sending your way all the time. Just like those signals he's sending your way all the time. And they're that close to you. And if you'd humble your mind, listen, if you just humble your mind and tune them in, 
You could hear from God. You know, so many people say, I never hear from God. What are you watching all the time? Days of our life is not going to give you, yay, thus saith the Lord. Amen. Amen. Days of your life is not going to have a fresh word from God. Uh, the inquire is not going to have, yay, I say. It's not going to have a word from Jehaziel. It might have a word from Gene Dixon or something like that, but it's not going to have a word from the Lord. You hear me? And people say, I just can't hear from God. It may be that you haven't humbled your mind. It may be that you haven't reached up there and grabbed that mind and humbled that mind and brought that mind into subjection so that you can hear a word from God. I tell you what I believe. I believe that everybody has the capacity to hear from God if they'll pay the price. Oh, man. Number three, verse four is the third point. I'm, I'm going quick. You see this. I'm going quick. I'm already on verse chapter number three. Look at verse four. It said Judah gathered themselves together. The third thing, whenever you want to hear from God, come together under the sound of the word of God. You know what? I don't have much pity on you people that live here nearby. Whenever hell strikes at you and whenever you come under attack of the devil, we have church here Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We have church five days a week. It's taxing on our bodies. It's tough. It's wonderful, but you have to pay a price and it's tough. But you come under attack and you don't even go out and take the initiative to crank your car up and drive a few blocks or a few miles across town to be in a service to gather together with the people of God to hear a word from God. You sit home and waller in your misery and waller in your pity and you say, oh, God's forsaken me. Pastor, will you come over here and pray for me? Why don't you come over here and meet us one night and we'll all pray together? Are you listening? Come over here and we'll all get together. The Bible said they gathered themselves together. Friend, I want to warn you of something. Watch out who you gather yourself with. In a time of crisis, you sure don't want a Job's comforter in your ear. You sure don't want to get with the wrong people. Well, I don't know. My cousin died of that. <laughs> Amen. Oh, thank you for those words. God bless you. I feel so much better. Watch the funeral home's number again. <laughs> Amen. Watch who you gather yourself. It says they gather themselves together. You know, there's something about it whenever I'm going through it. Thank God for a wife that God has given me that's a woman of faith. And we both get together, even if we may be hundreds or thousands of miles apart, we can get together on the tele uh, telephone and talk. And when I hang up, I feel better. Why? Because two people of faith just got together and blended and mixed their faith. You can be strong in the things of God and make the wrong call to a wrong friend to a negative, cynical, pessimistic friend. And the first news you know, friend, you're down for the count. The devil has got you down on the mat, and he's got you pinned. But I say to you in the name of the Lord, get up off that mat and let God give you a fresh word. Gather yourselves together with people of faith. It says, number one, what did they do? They sought the Lord. They humbled their mind. They gathered together. And verse 6, look what it says. And they said, O Lord God of our fathers, art thou not God in heaven? Don't you rule over the kingdoms of the heathen? And in your hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand you. You know what they did, number four? They remembered the Lord. I said they remembered the Lord. Rehearse past victories, friend. You know what David did before he faced Goliath? He rehearsed what he did to the lion and the bear. You know what? What if he would have rehearsed this? Think about this. There's Goliath standing there. He's huge. His nostrils are extended. He's got fire in his eyes. He wants to kill that little twerp. <laughs> and the Bible says that David rehearsed past victories. Here's what he rehearsed. He disciplined his mind that he thought on the lion he saw him dead in his mind. 
he saw the bear, that big old bear, those big claws. He saw him laid over, heart stopped, neck broke, he's dead. That's what he rehearsed. And he said, I remember the power of God that came on me when I killed that lion barehanded, and I remember how I felt when I killed that bear. Buddy, you're going to be no different because I feel that on me now. You see? But what if David would have stood there before Goliath and said, oh, my God, my brothers, my brothers did me wrong. My brothers said I couldn't do this. And my brothers, I believe they're out there in the trenches right now snickering at me. Suppose he would have got his mind in that vein. You know what would happen? His shoulders would have drooped. His slingshot would have went limp. He would have dropped his rocks in the dust. And Goliath would have took his head off. If you want to hear from God and you want to suddenly from God, you better remember the Lord. And you better rehearse past victories. Let me tell you something else. Don't you just rehearse past victories when you're in a tight place. Rehearse them when you're in a good place. Rehearse them when the sun's shining, when the children are well, when the marriage is thriving, and when the money's coming in. You rehearse the goodness of God. Don't you wait until you get in trouble the next time to rehearse the goodness of God. Rehearse them all the time. Rehearse them all the time. I think God even said something about people putting them on their forehead, putting them on the gatepost, putting them on the door, just thinking on him all the time. You know what? America, an American church would be a lot better off if we'd start thinking on the Lord all the time. Amen. Amen? And it said they rehearsed and they remembered the things of the Lord. Boy, I'll tell you, I've had a chance to do that lately. I've got to hurry, though. I'm going I'm to close today by telling you something good. Verse 7. Look this way. They said, Art thou not our God who did drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel and gave it the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? You know what you've got to do, number seven? Three words. Declare your relationship. Number three. Declare your relationship. Number one, seek the Lord. Number two, humble your soul. Number three, gather together. Number four, remember the Lord. Number five, declare your relationship. Look this way. When you talk to God, do it like this. You're my God. Amen? You're not Kilpatrick's God. You're not Hill's God. You're not old Robert's God. You're not Israel's God. You're my God. You're the God of my family. You're the God of the relationship that I've had with you. You are our God. You are my friend. You are my father. You are my elder brother. You are my everything. Remember and rehearse your relationship with God. And the next one is this. Number six, review your testimony. And review your testimony, verse 7, it says this. Didn't you drive out the inhabitants of the land before thy people Israel? And didn't you give it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend, forever? What they were doing is they were remembering the testimony of Abraham. God gave that land to Abraham. It said, how long did you give it to him for? Look at that one word there. It says, the last part of verse 7, the last two words. It said, and you gave this land to the seed of Abraham, thy friend, for how long? Forever. Now, you know what Israel was doing here whenever they gathered together before God? They were telling God, God, can I put you in remembrance of something? Hey, God, Mount Seir and Ammon, those armies are out there. Those three armies are out there. They're coming in. They're coming in. No doubt about it. But before they come in, We've gathered ourselves, we're seeking you, we're humbling our mind, we're doing everything we can, Lord, but now I want to remind you, didn't you promise this land to your friend Abraham forever? Now, if you promise this land to your friend Abraham forever, it means that we shouldn't lose this land now. So we've got the land, there's three armies out there. They're going to come in and do some terrible extensive damage. But Lord, if you gave it to your friend Abraham forever, I want to remind you right now of that word forever, which means that you're a God that can't lie, and we're not going to have to let go of this. So we're going to win. 
I want to tell you something here this morning, friend. Jesus Christ has pledged himself to you forever. He didn't say, I am your Savior from a few things. He didn't say, I am your healer from a few diseases. He did not say, I am your deliverer from a few things. He said, I am the Lord thy God, and there is none beside me. And he said, you are the apple of mine eye. And he said, none shall pluck you out of my hand. What does that say? None shall pluck you out of my hand. Are y'all listening? Okay, number seven. Restate your covenant. Verse nine, restate your covenant. You said when evil comes upon us and the sword and judgment and pestilence and famine, we stand before you in this house and in your presence, your name is in this house, we cry unto thee in our affliction and you're going to hear and help. In other words, they were restating God's covenant. They said your name is in this place. You know, when the paper hit us so hard back in November of 97 and that series of articles came out, I didn't even know if I was going to survive as pastor because everything was put in such a way that it made us look like thieves, charlatans, and the ultimate of religious deceivers. That's the way it made us look. I did fine when I read the paper until I walked through the kitchen and I saw John Michael sitting there with a paper open on the kitchen counter and the paper was soaking wet where he had cried tears as he read it about his daddy. That's when I got furious because I've always tried to protect my child, my children. I've always tried to protect them from church trouble. I've always tried to protect them from bad things, never told them bad things. But when they did that to my son, I felt, <laughs> I wanted to go down and bless the place. <laughs> I remember we had to close out the service because we'd take a break every December here. And for two weeks, it was hot and heavy around Pensacola. And two weeks after it came out in November, the midweek of the mid part of November, it was time for the church to be closed. It was time for me to take off and Steve to take off. We were bone tired. And we take off the month of December to rest and we come back up right after the first of the year. I didn't want to take off because I felt like if I was gone, <clears throat> there was so much undercurrent and so much evil and trouble. Rumors. I felt like that the church was going to implode and just collapse and the church was going to be ruined. That's the way I felt. But I remember praying, and the Lord gave me this verse of Scripture right here in verse 9, and it said, If when evil comes upon us as the sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we stand before thee in this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house. You see that? Thy name is in this house. And I didn't see them, but when I stood here the last Sunday in November before we took that month break, I stood here that last Sunday, just recovering. I came back right before the paper hit to try to talk to Brownsville and let them know the paper was going to hit, and I had to come back in a wheelchair. I wasn't well yet, and I had to come back in a wheelchair. It was a vicious, vicious time. Mentally, I broke more than bones. When I broke all those bones and I had that terrible fall, it broke something else in me. It really did. And I wasn't well when I came in that Sunday morning in my wheelchair. But when I dismissed the service and I told him I'd see him in January, I really didn't know if I'd see him in January again. I didn't know if I'd even have credentials. I didn't know if I'd been in prison. Not that I'd done anything wrong, criminally wrong, but they were after us that viciously that I was expecting. I just didn't know what to expect. But I remember <clears throat> the last words I said was, Lord, your name is in this place. And the Lord gave me confidence as I looked at that back there toward those back doors, that exit sign. The Lord gave me confidence that he had posted some major warring angels at this church. And the Lord said this, 
It's out of your hands. And I want to say something to you this morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's out of your hands. It's out of your hands. <clears throat> it doesn't mean a hill of beans that John Kilpatrick's name is on the sign out there on Mobile Highway. That doesn't mean a hill of beans. It means nothing. I could have fell that day when I fell in September of 97. The doctor told me, he said, John, <clears throat> he said, I've never met a man alive that had a fall like you did and broke the bone. I won't mention the bone. But he said, I, I never met a man alive. I met many of them that were dead in the morgues. They were dead. But he said, I never met the first living person that had that, those bones broken like that and survived. You're the first one. When I hit that floor that day, I could have easily died. And you know what would happen? Right now, this church would be in session right now, just like this right here, and there'd be another man with this microphone on, and I'd be in eternity, and there'd be another man standing here with this microphone on, and this church would rock right along. That's just the way it happens. That's the way it works. So it doesn't mean anything to say, John Kilpatrick's name is in this church. Oh, gosh. But it means everything to say that the name of the Lord is in this place. And I want to tell you something else. The name of the Lord is not in this place, but the name of the Lord is on your forehead. God has you marked, and he has your name. He has his name in your forehead. The Antichrist will put his number. That's how impersonal he is. He'll put his number on people's foreheads, but the saints have the name of the Lord on their foreheads. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? Well, I got to hurry. Y'all want, want me to go ahead and finish? Yeah. Where are we at? Yeah. Number eight. Call for his salvation. Verse 12. <clears throat> oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that comes against us. Neither know we what to do. Our eyes are upon thee. What you do then is you're calling for God's salvation. You're saying, Lord, come! And you bring righteous judgment. Let it be quick, but you come and bring righteous judgment. And the Bible says they came with their little ones and their wives and their children, and they waited to hear from God. Now, number nine, wait on the Lord. Number nine, wait on the Lord. It doesn't mean you're going to have to camp out and build a sanctuary there. It just means wait on the Lord. Look at the last part of verse 12. It says, they've come against us. We don't know what to do. Our eyes are upon you. And it said, all Judah stood before the Lord and their little ones and their wives and their children. Our eyes are upon thee. Wait on the Lord. And number 10, and this is it, God will speak. God will speak. But here's what happens. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. When God speaks, believe his prophets. Don't believe just any prophet. The Bible says, know those that labor among you. Know those. When the Bible says the Spirit of God fell on Jehaziel, he was a proven and tried prophet. I've been asked this question a lot. Brother Kilpatrick, do you believe that today there are prophets, men of God walking around, women of God walking around that is used in the office of prophets? I don't know. I don't know. I'm being totally honest. I believe that I have met people that he's used to give prophecies, but I don't know that there are any people walking around today as prophets. There probably are, because I'm not the judge. I don't know. But I do know that God has spoken to my life several times through people that he has used in prophecy. Now I want to close with this this morning. I had a divine appointment last week. I want to leave you this, leave this with you this morning to encourage you. I told you a few weeks ago, and friends, certainly I don't like to get bogged down in problems and all that kind of stuff, and I don't like to talk about myself, but in this particular issue, I think I need to allude to what happened in my own personal life because the Lord told me 
that what he was doing in my life, he wanted to do in the congregation. So I want to build your faith here for a few minutes, and I want to encourage you to be loosed to expect the unexpected. When all that stuff happened, I didn't get behind this pulpit these last several years and talk about things that happened because I knew it would cast the congregation down. There's been many times I've come behind this pulpit right here. I didn't have anything in here. I was so attacked, so fought, that it took everything I could muster to get up there and preach. I'd leave out of here, go home, terribly oppressed of the enemy. I know the devil fought Steve, and I know the devil fought Lyndall. Because Steve is very important to this revival, and Lyndall is very important to this revival. I'm important to the church. I understand that as the pastor, I'm important to the church. But for some reason, the devil focused on me, and he attacked me viciously, almost killed me, and other things. I won't go into all of them, but it was just one repetitive thing after the other. After a while, I felt like I was in a daze. There was a number of things. I won't tell you how many, but there was a number of things <clears throat> that happened where I absolutely felt like I didn't know if it would ever budge again. I mean, I didn't know if it would ever budge again. It was hellish attack of the devil. I saw things that was locked up like that, and I just didn't see them changing anytime soon. And they didn't change anytime soon. I endured some things for over two years. Boy, I tell you, I... I was in a rough place, friends. I'd go off and preach. When I was off preaching, I wanted to be home. When I was home, I wanted to be off preaching. When it was morning, I wanted it to be night. When it was night, I wanted it to be morning. I was in a bad place. And things were locked up like that. And the devil was screaming in my ear, it's not going to change. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. But I just kept my focus on the Lord. That's all you can do. You just hold on. Stay faithful to my wife. Love my children. Love the church God's given me. Love the move of God. And I want to say this to you too. Even if it means my life, even if it means my life, I would gladly give that in order to see God's people help today. It's not going to require my life. It required Jesus' life. But I'm saying even if it required my life, I'm still willing to go through every bit of that again to see God have a place to move by his spirit. I mean that with all my heart. So I'd be off preaching, and the Lord give me that thought on those suddenlies. Then I wanted to preach it, and I'd get home, and I could just tell it just died, wilted in me when I got home. And so the Lord, about a month ago, spoke to my heart, and he said this. He said, now is the time that I'm going to do some suddenlies for you. <clears throat> and he said, I'm going to give you some suddenlies. And he said, just as I give them to you, I want you to tell your congregation that what I'm doing for their pastor, I'm also going to do for them. And I'm talking about things that have been locked up. So last Friday, I got a call from a man. I won't, I won't name him because he, he might not even want me to name him. But he said, Brother Kilpatrick, he said, I just got in from Malaysia and I'm real sick. And he said, I don't know if anybody would rather have to lay hands on me than you. And he said, I've got to go back overseas and I can't even walk across the floor. I am so sick. He said, would you come pray for me? And I said, sure. I'll miss revival and I'll go and pray for you. And I went. He said, when I got 30 miles away, he began to feel better. Just began to feel better. As a matter of fact, I was going to meet him at his house, but whenever I called him 30 miles from away, 30 miles away, he said, I'm going to be at the church. So I met him at the church. When I got there, me and Brenda, he said, I've got a word of the Lord, a word from the Lord for you. And let me tell you what happened. 
In the last 30 days, I saw one situation that I thought would never change just that quick. When I got blasted so bad in the paper, I was moving out of one house into another house, the house that we built, where Brent and I's plan on just staying the rest of our lives. And I moved in our home that we're in now, but when I moved out of my other home, I don't know if it was because of the papers or whatever, but it would not sell for over a year. And I had those payments, and it wouldn't sell. People would look at it, it just wouldn't sell. Last Thursday, it sold. Last Thursday. And there was another situation that I won't get into as personal, but there's another situation that I had to hear from God, and it, it was approaching. I had to hear from God, and it changed too. There was, and one more thing, there was four things that would not budge for years. They all happened within three weeks. Three weeks. All happened in three weeks. So, I get over there, and this man of God lights in, and buddy, he read mine and Brenda's mail. And he said, in the last few days, he said, the wind has shifted over your home and over your life. And he said, the storm clouds have now parted back and the sunshine is on your shoulders now. And he said, the Lord said to tell you, yea, he said, the Lord said to tell you that he has sent a warring angel to protect you now. A warring angel. And then he went on further and told me things, friend, that only God. Brenda, am I telling the truth? Stand up. Stand up. Am I telling the truth? It was only God, wasn't it? It was only God. And he even told me some things that confirmed something about which way we're about to go here. And it had to be God. In the last three weeks, I have seen God turn four things for me just like that. And I'll tell you what it felt like. Listen, I'll tell you what it felt like. I told Brenda three weeks ago before this all started happening. Y'all listening? I told her three weeks ago before all these sudden things started happening to us, before they started, I told her, I woke up one morning, and I said, Brenda, you know, there's a change. I said, I can't explain it, but there's a change. I said, it feels like that some kind of structure that's been over us is being dismantled. And I could envision bolts that was holding that demonic structure together. I could envision the bolts falling out on one side and the nuts falling out on the other side. And it was like somebody was just dismantling that structure where hell sharpshooters had been shooting at us from a platform. I could feel that being dismantled. I could actually feel it being dismantled. And it was like all of a sudden I looked around again and I could, I could hear birds. It was like I could look around and I could... Smell smells I hadn't smelled in two or three years. It was like some kind of a structure was being dismantled. When the Lord gave me that message Friday night, and it was a word from God, friend. I don't care what anybody says. It was a prophecy from the Lord. The Lord spoke this, and he said, I gave you these messages on my suddenlies. And he said, they have all fallen exactly right on the Sundays that I wanted you to preach them. And he said, now tell the congregation this Sunday, which is today, he said, tell the congregation that just as that is being dismantled over you, it's being dismantled over the people. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Praise the Lord. Just praise the Lord. understand these things. It's far too deep for us to really grasp and understand. But Lord, even though we don't understand it, we thank you that it's being dismantled. 
And we thank you that where that darkness and that oppression has been over us for a while, especially key families in this church, that has paid a price along with all of us to see you visit this place and pour out your spirit. Lord, I thank you for dismantling the structures of hell and for sending warring angels now to be with us in a powerful way. Lord, I thank you for the sunshine that I feel on my shoulders right at this moment. And I ask you to let the congregation right now while I'm speaking as a prophet of God, a man of God, you said, believe my prophets and you will prosper. I'm asking, Lord, right now as a minister, a man of God, a pastor, that they will believe the word that I'm giving them and that right now while I'm speaking, they'll begin to feel the sun on their shoulders also. Lord, may their ears hear the nuts and the bolts falling on the concrete as that demonic structure is being dismantled. Oh, there's only one thing I got to say. Look this way. There's only one thing I got to say. Woe, woe to the enemy that has done these things. Woe to them. Because God has arisen. I told Brenda that on the fourth anniversary of this revival, when God poured out his spirit, last Sunday was four years, Father's Day was four years. I told her three weeks before that, I said, Brenda, I don't understand. I don't know, I don't know why God does times and things like that. I don't understand it, but I see it all through Scripture. Three weeks before Father's Day, it felt like, another thing that I was feeling, it felt like that a vehicle was climbing a hill and just last week, it felt like that vehicle planed out like that. I could feel the back tires come over the hump. We made it. We made it. And somebody says, what does four mean in the Bible? Who cares? <laughs> we made it. Three stands for Trinity, seven stands for completion, six stands for man, you know, all that. I don't know what four stands for. And, I'm, and don't write me and tell me and call me those things, you know, because we'll get 7,000 different interpretations. But I felt like that our vehicle just reached the plateau and we reached that four years and hell has had to back off now. I know that 40, I know that 40 stands for time of testing. I know that. And it could be that we went through a time of testing. But I'm here to tell the devil we made it. We made it. We made it. We made it. And I tell you what, it ain't over yet. I believe the best days are ahead. The Lord told me the other night, <clears throat> uh, you know, I'm not taking any credit, don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying that, that this man of God, had he didn't know this. But when I prayed for Lisa Cook, you know, that was healed of the tumor, you know, the doctors would biopsy the tumor and everything, sent it off, it was cancerous, they measured it. She asked us to pray for her, her dad and mom asked me to pray for her back there in the back room, and I prayed for her, and I'm not taking the credit, I'm giving all the glory to God. I just want to tell you something here. I remember when I was praying for her back there in the back room, just me and her and another couple of guys. I said, Jesus, I stopped right in the middle of my praying, and I said, Jesus, whoa, let's, let, let me just stop here and ask you. When she goes back to the doctor, would you let the doctor say, whoo, you know, I can't even find that tumor? And I said, um, Lord, would you let that happen? And then I finished praying for her and completely forgot about it. She came back. She went back to the doctor before they were going to send her to Shan's hospital. And she said that the doctor said, he felt so hard on my neck that he hurt me. Could not find that tumor. They called Shan's and Shan said, unpack your bags, just stay where you are. That must be a religious fanatic. <laughs> must be a religious fanatic. And what this preacher said to me the other day was, what this minister said to me the other day was, he said, Holy Spirit is going to start fulfilling some things that he's promised you a long time ago, including some healings, which has already started and it has shocked you.
He said, healings. He said, there's going to be some healings that you're going to say, well, Lord, where have they been all these years? And he said, they have already started happening. And he said, it's already shocked you. And you'll be shocked further in the future at the healings that God is going to do. So I'm giving all the glory to God, friends. But I just tell you, the car has topped the hill. We passed the test. Somehow we passed the test. The structure of the devil has been dismantled. That doesn't mean he's dead. It doesn't mean that. But it, it does mean this. We're moving ahead. And I tell you, I want you to come with us. I want you to get on board. And I want us to move together like a mighty troop. In step. In step. Just move together. And let's come against the power of hell. Amen? God bless you. Amen. How many of you plan on staying on board and going with us? Amen. How many, of you can, how many of you would agree that you can sense that same thing taking place in your life? I can testify personally myself. I just, I mean, you can talk to my staff. I've been telling them. I just, I just feel, I feel shift. I feel change. I feel, I feel like we're about to hit into another gear. And um, in just a moment, we're going to have communion. But before, before we do, I, listen to me. You know, right before you go into that next gear and, and right before the Lord gives us that breakthrough, when, when we're weary and when we're tired and we're looking at all the, the, the you know, the, the, the battle ahead and all that, we become very vulnerable at that moment. You realize that. And it's easy for us to let our guard down and give, lose hope and allow things to slip back in that we had dealt with before. And before we pass out communion and we begin to worship him in, in, in that, I want to give you an opportunity to examine your heart. Church, is really important. Listen, it's important for us. Every time, every time God's going to give us a victory, he's going to first strengthen us so that we can handle the victory when it comes. And during that time, we get so weak and, and, and so frail sometimes and we can, we, can, uh, we can want to throw in the towel or we can start slacking up in our, in our commitment. We can let our guard down and the next thing you know, bam, you're on your back. And some of you are here and many of you are encouraged by the word, but you know what? There's some of you here that you're still saying, well, not me, Pastor. I can't even hardly pray right now. It just, it's so dark right now, Pastor. I, I hear what you're saying, and I see a lot of people around me excited, but I mean, it's dark. And I'm frustrated because I'm finding myself struggling with things I thought I was delivered from, and on and on the list can go. Listen to me, friend. Get up. I love a phrase. I, I, I said it yesterday in Illinois. I said it yesterday, I'm never down. I'm never down. I'm either up or getting up. Are you with me, church? I'm never down. I'm either up or getting up. And friend, you may, you may feel like you're down. Would you just get up? Let's get up this morning. God, God didn't bring us this far to leave us. Amen? He's going to bring us on through. But right now, very quickly, you're here in the building this morning. You say, Brother Richard, you know, I, I've been fighting and battling for so long, and, and I, I want to believe that, that we're cresting that hill, but... I, I've let my guard down, and I'm, I've I let myself slip. I'm, I just, I, my walk with God's struggling. I've allowed things in my life, and with the mercy and grace of God, I'm getting up again. And, and, and I just, I just need the Lord just to forgive me and to strengthen me and to, to help me to crest that hill. If that's you, I want you to just lift your hand this morning before the Lord and say, "That's me, brother Richard. That's me, Lord. That's me. That's me." Just lift it up real quick. Lift it up real quick. Would you lift your other hand to the Lord right now as a sign of surrender all over the place? Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we, we, we this morning, Lord, we, we recognize that in our weakness, we need you to be our strength. And Father, for those of us in this room, Lord, that we've blown it, Lord, we've, 
we've, we've let our guard down and the enemy's come in and given us a sucker punch, Lord, and, and we're finding ourselves struggling with the things that we once was, had victory over. Lord, I ask that you would forgive us and cleanse us and, and wash us and set us free. And Father, I pray that that adrenaline, Lord, that, that second wind, Lord, would come within your congregation. And Father, that hope would rise and faith would arise, Lord, as the word has been preached this morning. Lord, that that faith would arise because of the hearing of the word of God and Lord that you would deliver us and strengthen us Lord we have not come this far Lord for you to leave us but Lord we're going all the way through we're going all the way through and so Lord this morning we confess Lord our weaknesses we confess Lord our our downfalls we confess our sin and ask God forgive us and to come and strengthen us Lord come and renew us Lord that we can go on with you Father we ask it in the precious name of Jesus in Jesus name in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. The men of the church will come, both here and across the street. Men of the church, if you'll come and wait upon the people, I just want us to worship the Lord for a few moments. And as soon as everybody's served, pastor's going to come back and lead us, lead us in, in communion this evening, this morning. Amen. Didn't that minister to you this morning? Was that a great word? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Just worship with us this morning. Nothing too big that you aren't bigger. Remind us again, Lord, that you are in control. We know you can handle any challenge that we face. We promise you. in my presence and the things yet to come my days are in your hands each and every one I know you can handle any challenge that I face you promise you
closer than a brother. I want everybody to stand, please. Turn me up, brother. I'm so glad that we have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I don't know how God keeps up with all of us, but he does. And sometimes you may not think God's keeping up with you, but you don't know what he's kept you from. You're here, aren't you? If God's hand wasn't upon you and he didn't give permission for you to be here, you'd be gone a long time ago. But God's got a purpose for you, and those he has a purpose for, he protects and keeps. And Lord, I thank you that your body was broken, and I thank you for our health, and I thank you that you are the bread that came down from heaven, and you are the bread of life. And I thank you, Jesus, that you said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And Lord, as we take this this morning, and we ingest this into our system, we take your body into our body, and we remember what you did for us. Would you please partake with us? Thank you, Lord. The Lord said when the enemy comes in like a flood, he will what? He will raise up a standard. What is that standard? It's his blood. Every victory that you have in your life is because of this right here. This symbolizes the blood of Christ. Every victory that you've got is symbolized by this cup. Lord, I thank you for the blood that you shed on Calvary, not only for our sins, but we are overcomers because of your blood. That means we triumph, and we come out on the other side without even the smell of smoke in our garments. We thank you, Lord, for your blood that was shed that we can live forever. In Jesus' name, would you please partake with me? Hallelujah. Extend your hand this way, please. I'm going to bless you. Father, I bless Brownsville this morning. I bless this congregation, not only these in this building, but in the other buildings on this campus. I bless them. And Father, I speak that as a man of God, as I stretch forth my hands over them, that the Spirit of the Lord would just envelop them this week. Just nestle them up under your wings. You said you're a strong tower, but, oh, Lord, you have loving, warm wings that you just brood over us, and you watch over us so meticulously. Father, I bless this congregation this week to be protected from danger. I bless this congregation this week, Lord, that as they walk out of this place, off this campus, crank up their cars and go out on the highways and the byways, that there'll be protection for them as they're out there on the highways and the byways, but Lord, there'll be protection over their homes, that you'll keep their homes this week from fire, from theft, from danger, from lightning strikes, from flood, from tornado, from thieves breaking in. Lord, we speak in the name of Jesus that your people this week will discern, just lift up their heads, their chins, just lift them up toward the heavens and say, whew, I feel like a structure's being dismantled from off of me. Lord, I bless them this week to feel that, to feel that that dark cloud is gone and that structure's been dissembled and they can look up and smell the smells of victory and to feel the beams of the sun on their shoulder and say, my, isn't it a wonderful day? This is going to be a wonderful week. Father, I speak over Brownsville Assembly of God that the name of the Lord is in this place, that the name of the Lord is in this house. And Lord, when hell came against it with its mightiest onslaught, it still was not enough to even budge the pillars of the doorpost of this place. Father, I speak that there be warring angels loosed over this place and loosed around about all the inhabitants of this church. And Lord, I pray that over the membership and the attenders of this place that call Brownsville Assembly home, that there will be a warm presence of your spirit that will go with them this week. Lord, let them enjoy health. Let them enjoy a good report. Let the report of the enemy that brought fear and trepidation, let that report even be changed on paper where the doctor says, I don't know what it was, but it's not there anymore. 
Lord, we just speak it and we bless it. Lord, help these people this morning to latch on to the words of this pastor and believe the pastor so they can prosper and be established. I bless you, Brownsville, in the name of the Lord. And I speak that every attack of the devil back away from you and God's glory rest upon you like a diadem. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you.